Today we're going to continue to talk about David and a special box that made him really, really happy. Now this wasn't just any box. This was a super duper special box. Probably the most important box that the world has ever seen. Can anyone guess why? Well, the reason this particular box was so special to David in our Bible story was because it was a holy box that was surrounded by God's power. The box was called the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant were things that reminded the people of Israel how amazing God had been to them. Even though the Ark of the Covenant had a home, King David decided to move it closer to him to keep it safe. He sent 30,000 of his best men to protect it and bring it back carefully to Jerusalem. When they finally got back to Jerusalem, there was a huge party. You see, David wasn't just happy. David was joyful. In fact, even though he had lots of challenges, David was so full of joy that when the ark finally arrived in the city of David, he danced in his underwear. That sounds really embarrassing, but apparently it didn't bother him. Well, when David's wife saw him dancing from a window, though, she got mad at him. She didn't like that the king would humiliate himself like that. But David didn't care. He was so full of joy that he made offerings to God and he celebrated with the whole city. Burgers and fries for everybody. Well, okay, maybe it wasn't burgers and fries, but you get the point. Knowing that God was near filled David with joy. Now, something that fills me with a lot of joy is knowing that Vacation Bible School begins one week from tomorrow. That makes me want to party. Make sure that you have signed up to be part of the volunteer team by completing one of the yellow train ticket forms that I have right here. And check out our sign up for kids by going to the Grace in St. Luke's Facebook pages. There are a couple things that we need your help with. We need some suitcases. Any type of luggage would be great. Just make sure to place a luggage tag on the outside with your name on it. You see, we're just going to use them for decorations as we transform our St. Luke's campus into a rocky railway with a ticket booth and baggage claim and everything. You can drop them off anytime during the week. We also need cookies and brownies for our meal. If you'd like to provide cookies or brownies, just drop them off at the church from Friday, July 16th through Sunday, July 18th. We really appreciate your help in making this the greatest week of the year. And finally, remember that our weekly kids' lessons are uploaded on our website and Facebook pages. And even though this lesson is geared towards our younger folks, it's a great way for adults to learn more about kids and more about Jesus. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your worship. Good morning, church. It is great to see you today. I am so excited that you're here. I love hearing Jenny every week tell us what's going on in the children's department. I love her biblical interpretation, burgers and fries as they celebrate. What a great reminder for us of the beauty of God and, and how God prepares for us um, for those I have not met yet, my name is Brian Cook. I am the senior pastor over at Grace Church. It's my honor to be with you today to be able to celebrate and worship this morning. And for those I'm still getting to know, still meeting, uh, as you are preparing to donate cookies and stuff for VBS, I like peanut butter cookies. I like anything that is sugar cookie related, anything oatmeal, raisin. Those are some of my favorite. I'm just saying. I'm just putting out the, the, the request there. So just letting you know. But thank you for the ways that you serve. For those that are joining us at home, we're really excited that you are with us today. We want to invite you to let us know you're here. Let us know by dropping some comments down there. If you have a prayer request, any praises, we want to hear from you as well. And church, those that had a chance to pick up a connection card when you came in today, we want to invite you sometime during worship this morning to fill that out so we can make sure that we are connected with you in all of the appropriate places and ways, whether it's through text, emails. We just want to make sure that we're connected. And you too, if you have a prayer request 
or any praises that you want to share, we want to hear about them as well. Church, it is great to be with you and worship this morning. I invite you to hear the words from Psalm chapter 24 that remind us that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For God founded the earth on the seas. He established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in the holy places? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. Today, church, we have the wonderful privilege and opportunity to come and worship the creator of heaven and earth. And I'm really excited that you're here today. Welcome to worship. I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars. I'm skinned and scarred. Marred and twisted. Scarred by the past I need to be lifted. And sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light, unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time. Life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great, and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind. And something created me. No, someone created me. And that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up, someone who rose to fix me up, someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. We do want to welcome you to worship, and it's, it's really kind of fascinating to see things from up here because people respond to music and worship in so many different ways. And we respond to what Jesus has done for it, for us. And when we come together, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. It is just such a great thing. And we want to invite you into this environment during this time of music, uh, however God stirs you to worship him, however he speaks to you. If that means your hands are raised... Raise your hands. If that means that your hands come together and they clap, if that means you kind of move from side to side and you dance a little bit, uh, no underwear dancing. If you came in late, we were discussing David and the Ark of the Covenant. But if you're at home watching online, I can't stop you from that, okay? So just worship because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom and, and there's liberty and there is just a peace as well. So we invite the Holy Spirit here now, and we invite you here in the congregation or watching uh, on video to, uh, to sing with us and worship with us. If you're able, will you stand? Here we go. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory.
that you came so long ago and died for us. Thank you, Lord, that you're still able and willing and mighty to save, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Take 
take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I serve Sometimes I, I don't even know if I'm worth saving. Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> so when I sing a song like that, that reminds me that God is, is there and he's still our savior. I just think, why though, God? Why? Why would you save me? It just, it, it makes me think more about his love. That he would love a sinner like me. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful Savior. But the invitation is still there. Thank you. 
God, from the depths of our heart, we cry out today, Lord, that you would just fill this place. And Father, that we would notice your presence among us today. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray your blessing on this church, in this place, in this moment. Here, God, we pray that the faithful would find salvation, that the careless would be awakened in their journey. Come, Lord Jesus, in this moment of worship, we pray that the doubting would find faith, and that the anxious would be encouraged today. Here in this time, may the tempted find rest, may the strong be renewed today. Come, Lord Jesus. And here in this encounter of worship, may the aged find consolation and may the young be inspired today. Come, Lord Jesus. God of grace, God of glory, renew our spirit today. Renew our commitment on this day as we encounter you As we gather to bless your name and sing your praises today, God, come and fill this place and bless us with your glorious love and your guiding light. Come, Lord Jesus, and strengthen us each and every hour, each and every moment through the power of your Holy Spirit and the wisdom of your Holy Word. It's in hope. It's in joy that we pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Today, as we continue in our time of worship, we want to pause and say thank you, church, for the ways that you give, the ways that you pour into how God is calling us and inviting us and stirring us. Thank you for those who have already connected as volunteers for VBS. Thank you for signing up. If you have not yet signed up, there's still time. And uh, there's still space for you to come and to serve and to care for children and adults who are going to be working and serving and reaching out to our kids. So we want to invite you, as as, um, Jenny has already shared with you, there's volunteer sheets out in the foyer area. Please pick one up. Those who are joining us at home, if you would like to be a part of this and you're in the area of Kokomo, we invite you to call one of the church offices at Grace or St. Luke's and uh, let us know. We'll make sure we get you connected. Um, And we just thank you for all the ways that you just pour in of yourself. Thank you for giving your time, your presence, your prayers, your gifts. Thank you for all the ways that you pour in. There's a lot happening in the ministries of the Kokomo Connection with Par and Grace and St. Luke's. Lots of things happening with children and youth. We have a video that we want to share with you. Some of the happenings from uh, youth camp children's camp that went on the past couple weeks. The video that you're going to see is what took place this past week up at the Grace Cottage with our St. Luke's and our Grace kids, middle school and high schoolers. And we invite you to just watch and see how God is stirring among us.
This morning we continue in our worship series, Windows, a series based upon the book written by Kent Hunter. We're looking at the idea that the windows we look through, whether they're biblical windows or worldview windows, determine our comfort, our desires, our priorities as it comes to serving the kingdom that God has invited us to be a part of here on earth. I think most of you will recognize at least one of these churches. I hope you recognize at least one of those churches. Um, These are, are the three churches representing the Kokomo Connection. Um, you notice, obviously, St. Luke's and Grace and Parr, and what an incredible opportunity we have as um, an invitation to come together as the uh, cooperative parish work um, called the Kokomo Connection. If you look at a map of Kokomo and you map out where these three churches are located, they are strategically located throughout the community of Kokomo. Um, St. Luke's being this um, kind of suburban church in the middle of commerce with stores and shopping and restaurants all around and a neighborhood nearby. Grace Church being strategically downtown with strategic ministry to homeless folks living in poverty and, um, uh, and addiction and challenging issues downtown. And then you have Par um, located on the northwest side of town, right in the middle of a neighborhood. I have driven to that church the last several weeks um, and came into that church parking lot from a lot of different directions. In every direction that I come to the church in, I'm driving through neighborhood. All three of these churches are in strategic locations with strategic, missional, contextual opportunities. But each of these churches also have their own struggles. And I want to share with you a, um, just an excerpt from one of Kent Hunter's blogs, one of his writings, an interview that he had with a pastor by the name of Kelly. And this is what he wrote. Kelly sat at her desk, a little slumped in her chair. She is the pastor of a mid-sized congregation, and she looks fatigued. I'm worn out, she says, by all the busyness of the church. We are an active church, but we resemble a gerbil running on a wheel. We're moving fast, but we're going nowhere. She diagnosed the problem well. Pastor Kelly's church is a well-oiled machine of positive activity. However, in her own words, her church has little kingdom impact. I should have think about that for a minute. A busy, active church with a lot of activities going on, but the pastor herself says they're having very little kingdom impact. Our profile, she sighed, is like most churches. We're moving fast, we're going nowhere. We're plateaued, we're slowly declining, and as a congregation, we're aging. Pastor Kelly's church does many things well, but the question before us today is, are they doing the right things well? Each of these three churches that you see here that represent part of this Kokomo connection are doing a lot of stuff well. But the question before us today is, are we doing the right things well enough to make a kingdom impact? And that's the thing that we've got to wrestle with. That is the conversation before us today. That is the thing I want us to really reflect upon this morning. We are being reminded in this series, in this worship series, that God has called us to be part of um, his missional work that was set up from the very beginning of creation. If you remember the creation story as, as God was breathing life into a formless void, as God was creating form out of the chaos, he began to breathe life into the world, into his creation. And one of the commands that he gave to all of creation was to be fruitful and multiply. That's what we've been called to. That is the biblical posture of God. And Jesus, when he came to this earth, when he launched his earthly ministry, Jesus was working to fulfill 
the same covenant challenge, the same covenant um, commandment that God gave to all of creation, and that is to be fruitful and multiply. The only difference, when Jesus came into this earth, Jesus just worded it a little differently. Instead of saying being fruitful and multiply, Jesus used the words go and make disciples. It's the same mindset. It's the same multiplication um, theology that was set up from the very beginning of time. It's the math of multiplication. And this became Jesus' total focus of his earthly ministry. That was his greatest impact in all of history, was this idea of this multiplication mindset. Now, I know all of us know this symbol, this emblem. In fact, we have seen it enough that we are probably sick and tired of seeing this this emblem, this sign. And for those who can't see it from where you're sitting, this is the sign, this is the logo for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have heard about this for the past year and a half plus, and quite frankly, I know we're all tired of hearing about the Center of Disease Control, but we're thankful for the work that they have done, for the way that they have encouraged uh, all of our world to take care. But their whole focus, friends, their whole focus as a center is to prevent the spread of disease and the spread or to prevent any epidemic and pandemics to take place in our countries and around the world. And the one of the ways that they do this when a flu season comes before us or when we come into a season like COVID that we uh, are coming out of, their whole philosophy, their whole thought is to prevent the spread of disease and viruses, we should quarantine ourselves. And, and it makes sense. It's what we've done. It's how we've been able to fight through this recent pandemic. We've gone through this season of quarantine. But here's what I want us to think about as the church. The reality for the church for the past several decades is the church has been living in this mindset for a long, long time. We've come to this idea that quarantine is how we function as a church. And our mindset as a church is like this. We think to ourselves, or we've been thinking to ourselves the last many decades, that the world is corrupt, the world is broken. And so that we don't get influenced by the broken, corrupt world, let's just quarantine ourselves inside these beautiful buildings that we've built. Let's quarantine ourselves inside these beautiful institutions. And if any of the broken, corrupt world wants to come and get right, they'll come through our doors into our institutions. That's the mindset that we have been operating out of as a church for a long, long time. We've been operating under the mindset of the CDC and their whole idea of quarantining ourselves. That's how the church has operated. You want to know why 80 to 85 percent of the churches across our country and around the world are in decline or plateaued? It's because we've been operating in this quarantine mindset and we've been cloistering ourselves inside these beautiful buildings just hoping that people will come through the door one more time. And about 30 years ago, that's all we had to do. 30, 40 years ago, all most churches had to do was open up the front door and people would gather in. That day is gone, church. And although we're still living in the mindset of quarantining ourselves, shutting ourselves into these beautiful buildings away from a corrupt, broken world, that was never the the ministry, missional focus of God or Jesus. It was never their mindset. Their mindset was this, more of an epidemic faith. They, God created this world with this idea of not quarantining ourselves, but being this uh, group of people, these God people who would share a faith that would itself become an epidemic. That's how Christians um, are supposed to live our life. But instead, 
We've been living under that CDC model of quarantining ourselves, shutting ourselves off from the rest of the world so none of that brokenness, none of that corruption gets on us. Well, when God created the world, his whole idea was to create an epidemic faith. In fact, when Jesus came into the world and began his earthly ministry, he was hoping, he was intentional on creating a movement that would become a holy infection. And Jesus, when he came into this world, he never came into this world to create an institutional church that people would just gather into and separate themselves from the rest of the world. Jesus lived a life in his full intentions where we're creating this holy infection. That would each of the followers, each of the believers and the kingdom of God would get alongside other people, that we would come in contact with other people, and that our lives would overflow with the love and the grace and the mercy of God, that other people would catch that. That was the intentions from the very beginning of creation, and it was all intended to be multiplication-focused, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Go and make disciples. Go and multiply yourselves. But what the church has done, the 80 to 85% of the churches that have plateaued or are declining, what we have done is we've not been involved in multiplication. We've been involved in subtraction. And we've been cloistering ourselves off from a world that desperately needs to hear the beautiful message of God. Today, we're going to look at how the desires, uh, our desires determine our priorities. And we're going to be looking today at John chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. And the words are here on the screen. Jesus had to go through Samaria, and he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which is near the land of Jacob that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired from his journey. So he sat down at the well. It was about noon. As a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food, and the Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Well, Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. And Jesus responded, If you recognize God's gift and who is saying to you, Give me some water to drink, you would be asking him, and he would give you living water. Well, the woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket, and this well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go get your husband and come back here. Well, the woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say, I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You have had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. The woman said, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people will worship. You and your people worship what you don't know. And we worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming, and it is here, when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. And the Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. And the woman said, 
I know that the Messiah is coming to one who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will teach everything to us. Well, Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. And just then the disciples, Jesus' disciples arrived and they were shocked that Jesus was talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? And the woman put down her water jar and went into the city. And she said to the people, come and see. A man who has told me everything that I've done, could this man be the Christ? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And it is my hope and my prayer today that you are encouraged by its reading today. What is the beautiful picture of this story from John chapter 4 is we are seeing at work the harvest principles that were instilled in creation from the very beginning of time. This idea of multiplication, this idea of people pouring into or hearing the word of God being poured into them. And most of us are familiar with this story. We have heard it preached on. We have had Sunday school lessons on it. We have read it ourselves. This is a passage of scripture that we could go in a lot of different directions. But today I want us to, to see the focus here on Jesus Um, evangelistic ministry, the way Jesus poured into his context with these harvest priorities. Last week, you heard um, us talking about the way that Jesus poured into the lives of other people. And most of the time, Jesus never really waited for people to come to him. It happened occasionally, but for the most part, Jesus went to the people. And as Jesus went to the people, he was always engaged. He was intentional in starting most of the conversations and starting most of the relationships. Jesus, as we heard about Zacchaeus last week, he was the one who Jesus reached out to and said, I need to go to your house today and have a conversation with you. And it reminds us the same story here with the woman at the well. Jesus is the one that is initiating the conversation and the relationship. Notice what happens here as Jesus is living into these harvest priorities. Jesus is sitting at the well. Jesus desires a drink of water. He's hot. He's tired. But as he sees a woman, a woman coming to the well, she comes for one purpose and that is to draw some water. That's why she's there. And she's come at that time of the day for another purpose, to avoid everybody else. She doesn't want to have a conversation with anybody. I just want to get my water. I want to go home. And Jesus is engaged in these harvest priorities. He meets this woman right where she's at, and they have a common interest. They both want some water. And so Jesus captures her attention by reaching out to her and captures her curiosity by saying, could you get me a drink of water? And it enters into this great conversation between Jesus and this woman that Jesus is able to take her on a journey, talking about water to then talking about her life and the need that she has for more than water. And so as Jesus pours into her, as he begins to have this conversation with her, she asks, why are you even talking to me? Why are we even having this conversation? You, a Jewish man, me, a Samaritan woman, this is not supposed to happen. And Jesus stirs her curiosity by saying, if you only knew, who it was talking to you about water, you would ask him for the water that he has to offer, living water that would bubble up in you. And all she knows at this point is, I want water, and I would love the opportunity to never have to come back to this well again. So give me this living water that you're talking about. You're talking about. But how are you going to draw it? Because you don't have a bucket. This well is deep. How are we going to do this? How are you going to give me this living water? And she begins to have this conversation with Jesus. And as she's talking about giving me the water, Jesus says, well, go back to your home and bring your husband here. Let's talk about the living water. And she confesses in this moment, I don't have a husband. And and Jesus pours into her even further and says, you're right in answering that way. In fact, you've had five husbands and the one that you have now is not your husband. 
Well, she's quick to want to change the conversation, and she begins to talk to Jesus about, you've got to be a prophet. If you are a prophet, let's talk about religious things right now. Let's not talk about my life. Let's talk about religious things. Your people say we need to water, uh, worship in Jerusalem. Our people say you need to worship on this mountain. And Jesus changes this whole conversation at the well. And he begins to remind her that it's not water that people need. It's this encounter with the, the risen Christ. It's an encounter with Jesus in a manner that brings grace and mercy. This is what we need. These are the harvest priorities that we need. And in this conversation, this woman is changed in an instant. Her priority of coming down and getting water has now changed. She leaves her jar. She goes back to her village. She starts inviting the people to come down. Notice what has just happened. She's gone from drawing water to now she is engaged in the multiplication mindset of the kingdom here on earth. She goes back to the village and begins to invite the people to come and see. You've got to come and see this man who knows everything about me. In the meantime... While this is happening, the disciples have come back. They've seen Jesus talking to the woman, and they're curious themselves, why is he talking to her? What is going on here? Nobody dares ask. All that they want at this time is to feed Jesus. They've gone into the village, gone into the neighborhood town to get food. They just want to eat and have a dinner, a meal with Jesus. And their whole focus is on their stomach and on food. And what we have here is Jesus is not only teaching the woman, about to teach the people from the village, but he's also wanting to teach the disciples that there's more to our life than our comfort of water and food and our own desires. There's more to this life than that. We have all been extended this invitation to be part of the harvest priorities of, of making disciples, of pouring into people. And it's what this message is all about. It's the power of priorities in our life. And the priority of the woman, the priority of the disciples was that of water and food. And Jesus' priority in this moment was this kingdom work that he was here to do. It's one of the biggest struggles we face as a church because our priorities um, dictate the direction that we move in our ministry and in our calling. And for many churches, we want to just sequester ourselves off from the rest of the world. We want to be comfortable away from a broken, corrupt world. And we come and our whole focus is on comfort and our whole priority is on making sure that we, we keep the institutional church separated from the rest of the world. No corruption can be in here. And I agree with that. But the reality is that was never our call. What has happened to the church and our mindset of quarantining ourselves off is many of our churches have moved into a maintenance ministry instead of a missional calling. We've gone into this idea of moving from um, going out into the world and, and, and sharing this beautiful message to just maintaining these beautiful churches that we have, maintaining our ministries that we've grown so comfortable with, maintaining our comfort level. And that was never how God ever intended it for us. Jesus poured into the disciples. He poured into all the people and he said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's what we need to grab a hold of today, church. We are a called people who are called to go we are called to be sent into the world. We are a sent people. And we were never called to just come in here and quarantine ourselves off from the rest of the world. We are to go. We're to go as missionaries into the world. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're all supposed to go overseas. Most of us are supposed to be sent to our own backyard to our families, our co-workers, the neighbors, the places we eat, the places we shop. This is our missionary world. This is the places that we are to be sent. And so this, my friends, is our call. We are to go into the world. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world. It doesn't say that God so loved the church. 
it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Um, and this is our call to go into the world. Here's a couple things that I think we need to think about today. I think we need to re-examine our focus. Are we looking at being engaged in the kingdom work that God is calling us to? Or is our desire, is our priority to keep our comfort and just make sure that we're preserving these institutions that we know as the church? Where is our focus? What do we need to be changing in our focus? The other thing I think we need to examine today is what do we need to do? to align our desires and our priorities with those of God? What are the things that we need to let go of? What are the, the comfort things that we need to put aside to be engaged in this calling to go into the world? Let me pray for us today as we can come to this time of closing our worship together. God, we thank you for the beauty of worship today, being able to sit at your feet, being able to linger here. And God, in this story, when the woman came to the well, she was in a hurry. She wanted to get her water. She wanted to get home. But in this conversation with Jesus, she lingered. And so, God, I thank you for the privilege we've had today to linger at your feet. And now, as we prepare to leave here, may we go, not quarantining ourselves from the rest of the world, but may we go as your servants, as your called people, to go and to share the beauty of this message of grace and love and mercy. We love you, God. We ask all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to church to stand as you are comfortable, as you are able, as we join our worship team today singing our closing song, Come As You Are. find your mercy O oh, sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal so lay down your burdens lay down your shame
earth has no sorrow that heaven can be. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Come as you are. Come as you are. It's the beauty of this message at the woman at the well. She came as she was, and in that conversation with Jesus, in that interaction, she was changed forever. Today, we come as we are, and in this encounter with Jesus today, we get to leave here knowing that we've been transformed, and we've been called to participate in the multiplication kingdom work that God has invited all of creation to be a part of. It's been great to be with you today, church. I am so glad that you were here. Have a great day, a wonderful week. Go and take the message of God's love with you. If you need prayer today, if you have a prayer request, something, a praise that you want to share, our prayer team is here. I invite you to come and pray with them, share a testimony. We love to hear how God is stirring. Take care. God bless. Mm-hmm.